All right, we are live. Guys, we're live here. Play it forward. David Buchanan right there, nominated by two great filmmakers as well, Alistair Cummings and John Hickman. They are writer-director duo. They were on the show last time, and they nominated David Cummings for his film, which is called, I don't want to screw it up, The Prime Location. That's correct. The Prime Location. and. Um, I'm just going to quickly set it up, David. It's a super smart, very cute, very funny, very clever, very, you know, it's a, it's a film that I was thinking to myself has a spine. It's got some, it's got some integrity and it's got some meat on it. And it's really, um, the zeitgeist of the moment, you know, really captures the zeitgeist. And for those of you who have not yet seen the film, I'm just going to hand it over to Dave, for David to set it up a little bit, but um, David, the film really, I mean, it, it's incredibly well done. I mean, professionally, you know, executed on all levels that, uh, but it's, what's more is that it's a just really a great piece of art that comments about our contemporary society and what we're all going through in a way that I haven't seen done before. Thank you. And, yeah, and it's really important, you know, that somebody cool. says something about what it is we're all experiencing in this water yeah. that we're all yeah. drinking, and without reflecting on it, and this mm -hmm. piece really reflects on it in such a profound way. Um, so I'll let you explain the sure. uh, the story. Okay. Well. Um so yeah, for, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's been playing on a few festivals in the UK. It's submitted to a bunch more, so we'll see what happens. But um, the general idea, uh, it's kind of two ideas I had that I put together into one. One, um, the st in terms of the story, um, it's based on a, a, an experience I had uh, when I was sitting on a bench in North London. Um, at the time, I, I kind of had kind of a cruddy job and I wasn't getting paid very much and I felt like I wasn't really going anywhere with my life. And on this, I was on this bench feeling a bit sorry for myself. And right past me jogged this tall, I mean, he may have had blonde hair, maybe retrospectively I'm imagining he had blonde hair, this tall, slender guy who just looked so healthy and so happy and so successful. And he was, he just, he, he just, yeah, like an Adonis of a man, exactly. And I, yeah. You're, you're just <laughs> and just the, yeah, I know. And I mean, at the time I was making coffees for people like him. Uh -huh. So I was just like, uh, yeah, and could barely pay rent. So the, just the very existence of this man just struck, made me so furious. And, but it was, the, it was the fact that he was jogging that made me furious. And, and I couldn't explain to anybody why that was. Uh, I just knew that deep down something about like, I knew that this man's success and the fact that he was jogging were somehow connected and that that made me really angry. <laughs> so uh, so it took, you know, that was that was the germ of the story. Anyway, the film is about that. And seeming success, we should say, right? Sure, yeah. We well, don't know. Yeah, I mean, we don't know. I don't know anything about him apart from that he looked extremely physically fit. He, he just had that kind of confidence to him, you know. Um, sure. So it's, yeah, but it's about, he was projecting success. And um, so anyway, it, the, the film kind of hinges on the main character, um, has a, has a phobia of joggers uh, and the film tries to get to the bottom of that and understand why that is. What is it about jogging that upset me so much? And I'm not against physical exercise, but it was, it was actually jogging specifically uh, that, that got my goat. Uh, so that's, that's one side of it. The other side is the technique, the visual technique. Um, I, I just uh, got into Chris Marker at that stage because he just died a few years ago and I went to a retrospective I saw, um, I, I, I believe they showed La Jete, which is obviously his classic um, his yeah. film. It's a, it's a, it's a sci-fi film made entirely using still photos and mm. audio. And mm. so that the technique that he had used in that, he, he has voiceover and I believe sound effects, and he just cuts together a, a series of still black and white photos to tell this story. Uh. And so I was hugely inspired by how economical a technique that was, the fact that you can not only you know save a hell of a lot of money you just have to take a load of stills but also 
the gap between those stills kind of creates a gap for you to pour your imagination into. So I found that a really interesting technique. So that's those are the two sides of my film really that, that are maybe worth worth discussing. Very interesting. Mm. So you know, as you're talking about the house, and as I'm thinking about one of the questions that I mm. wanted to ask you, you know, I noticed that it's you almost you know your hands kind of form the <laughs> sides of a home, and the film is called the prime location. Indeed, and it's so germane to what the story is all about to search mm. for the prime location in our life mm. yeah and finding it imagining it obsessing about it and and what we're being told right mm -hmm. now what our social context is telling us to for us how to reach that prime location yeah and so what's what's that real story all about what's the deep meaning there that we're that you're wrestling with well i suppose i didn't i had no idea what the meaning was until i had finished the film and making the film was part of figuring out what that meaning was and what i've come to realize retrospectively after making it is that let, let's call it that the prime location the kind of perfect place um it, there are there are two, right? There's the prime location, which we are, you know, told is what we should be looking for, which is a kind of a commonly accepted notion of success. But then the character in the film, you know, he, he longs for a different kind of um, place, which is a place of, of peace and a place where he's free to, you know, not to do what other people are telling him to do. There's a, I mean, I think, I think we can all empathize with the kind of need to, to, uh, wherever we think we're going with our lives, it's it's about finding a place where you know maybe you no longer have to work so hard, and you you've got a little patch of land that's yours, and all that kind of stuff. And and that we think that once we've got this little patch uh, all marked out, then we'll finally be we'll finally be happy and finally be free. And I guess it's kind of that's the that's the prime location that he's looking for. Well, that's brilliant. So, right, mm -hmm. so it's like it's achievement. So you have this tension and conflict between achievement. And peace and so mm. we're trying to achieve this state of peace that mm. is creating great tension and yeah strain and 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 the opposite of peace <laughs> in our lives you know the yeah diametric opposite of peace and if we weren't in such a anxiety or in such a rush or race to achieve maybe we would already have more peace and be naturally in the prime location, right? Totally, totally, yeah. It's like, how do you, how do you as a human being, how do you as an artist, how mm. do you as a, as a professional, man, and, and you're, you know, you don't mm. make a movie like this without being a professional, okay? Sure, so, yeah. And, and by that, you know, you, you do your job. You do mm. your job and you know how to do your job and you work hard, you know? Yeah. And I, you can see that right away. So. Mm. Anybody who achieves that level of, of um, cinematic integrity is a hard worker because we all know cinema is hard, you know, and any mm. artwork that's crafted and refined to this very elegant state is is a very laborious process. Yeah. I so, guess um, I guess that's fair to say about about my film that it was laborious. Um, I mean, and clearly it, it was made. The film was made extremely cheaply in terms of budget. Um, I think yeah, it was. Be able to know. Great. Sorry, say that again. Not that you'd be able to tell. Oh, good stuff. That's good. I mean, we pulled in a lot of favors. Um, I paid for it out of my own pocket, and you know, so in terms of in terms of that side of things, it's quite small scale. But in terms of the work and the thinking that I put into it. It, w it was um, uh, it went through at least five or six drafts and I, and I sp it had many permutations. It started out as a very serious film and then I redrafted it as a comedy. Uh, I really had to boil down what I was trying to say. Uh, I had test screenings. And I think from the moment when the jogger actually ran past me on that park bench to the premiere screening, I think it took about five years to develop, to develop the idea. 
That's so, so you know, it's five right years now. and a few thousand pounds. It's not a lot. Yeah, but it's, it's yeah. a novel's length of time. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, so, and uh, just it didn't feel, you know, there's, I didn't want to put out some kind of half, half thought through, especially if you're doing something which is a little bit political. I think you really need to be very sure of what you're saying. Um, so I think that was why it took me so long. So, and, and, it's, and it's brilliant, and, and how do you, um, how do you uh, justify, not justify, how do, you, how do you balance in your own life that discrepancy mm. between achievement and peace? Mm. Um, well, they're in direct conflict, and especially if you're trying to make films, there's, you know, it's, very, it's not a peaceful thing at all. Um, and I, I can't really reconcile it. Um, I, I know that, you know... I, no, old man, you can't offer me anything? Uh, well, I, I certainly don't make films for pleasure. I, I make it for, you know, I, I make it because, um, you know, I'm compelled to, uh, more through kind of, um, maybe like anxiety or something, makes me, makes me want to, to make films and to write stuff. Like a sense that, like, something is wrong, and if, if only I could write one more film, that would fix it. Um, yeah. You know, who knows? Maybe, maybe it will. Um, but certainly, you know, like I'm in terms of um, like I'm I'm quite similar to the character in the film. Really, I I really I really enjoy being lazy. I really enjoy going for walks and and just doing nothing. And um, so I yeah I mean I don't I just have to pass all my life out basically. And like you know making a film is quite stressful. And then other times I don't make films and it's not stressful. Yeah. So yeah. Try to balance with you know, uh, give and take on what you're actually Yeah, doing. yeah, and there are rewards, you know, like if you if you make a breakthrough or you write, like you write a good line um, or you, you think of like how to solve the problem, then that's, it's really satisfying. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind that. of anxious state for me. Mm. How would you describe, so, so is that what the satisfaction is? Is that the break or the, or the pause and the anxiety? Is it like, oh yeah, this makes sense, and this is the perfect moment. yeah, yeah, and it lasts for like five minutes, and then you're like, oh well, I've actually got to do something about it now. Yeah, so, you know, so you get these little nuggets of of satisfaction, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and that keeps you going, you know, and it, it is satisfying when you actually one of the best parts is sitting down in post with the editor or with the sound designer and seeing it all come together, and that I find that actually quite relaxing and quite. Quite enjoyable yeah, yeah yeah I can definitely relate to that so yeah. I think we've covered the first question which is why this story and, and essentially it's something that was innate in you to reconcile and I love how you know we, when we talked about this first time you mentioned this and I think it's really profound that you also mentioned this uh, this time and I'm glad that you do that you didn't really understand what you wanted to say what the story mm -hmm. was trying to say until you yeah. did. Yeah, literally until, um, literally until after the first cut of the edit, actually. We'd already done a cut of the film, and I still didn't know quite what I was trying to say. And it was only after a test screening when a, a friend of mine, who's another writer, um, he just pinned me down and said, look, you've got, to, you've got to make a decision about this ending. It's not working. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, right until about a few weeks before the premiere, I still didn't quite know what it was about. You know, and then and we changed we changed the final line the, like there's last couple of lines of dialogue, uh, and it all it all came together. And in, it, in my mind. you know, and that's such a testament to I think why you know also the satisfaction about art and why people make mm. art and why venture out into that unknown yeah. story. And because if you know the answer, why make it? You know, why not just tweet it? You know, if you if you if you can explain your idea in so succinctly, it doesn't need to be a film. I would argue. Yeah, absolutely, mm. absolutely. So that the mystery and the exploration is part of the process yeah. of yeah. and part of the point. For me, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Mm. And uh, you're right. You know, you're right. It is for you. I mean, maybe it's not for everybody. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I make. I try to make the films enjoyable for other people, but it, but it's got. It's something that I am particularly trying to solve in my head. Yeah, for my own peace of mind. Cool. Mm. Yeah. So next question is, um, really, what changed? Hmm. Um, 
Well, I think we've kind of covered a little bit of that in terms of the film because the genre changed from start to finish. And originally I had written it, you know, right off the back of seeing that Chris Marker retrospective. It Originally the film was a straight ahead, serious art house essay film, which, excuse me, which I was going to do my own voiceover for. <laughs> and um, I was gonna, it was just going to be kind of me exploring my feelings um, in a very sincere way. Uh, and so the change there was immediately like, I realized that it was it worked much better as a comedy. Um, so that was one. Uh, another change was actually the middle section. Um, for if, if people hopefully get to see this film at some point, there's a whole middle section of the film which is told inside a property website. So there are, um, you know when you go on like uh, uh, one of those search websites, you can click on a house and it will show you 12 stills of the house. Of course. So, so the whole, yeah, we all do it. We all do it late at night. But I we, can't believe it, we, man. It's such a thing. Yeah, I know. We all do it when we're drunk as well. At least I do. I would, uh -huh. get, I would get super wasted. I would, I would be living in LA and I would, maybe if I was homesick, I would like drink a gin and tonic and stay up late and I would like Google properties back in England and I'd look in their gardens, you know, like imagining I was in their gardens. That's great. I mean, we all, yeah, it's, there's a kind of voyeuristic thing, a really powerful voyeuristic charge to those, um, to those websites, which like draws you in. And I felt that was very cinematic in itself. Mm. So, so that so what changed in terms of that is originally i thought it was fine simply to i was going to steal a bunch of photos off some property websites and just use those and have and use real houses and have voiceover so anyway we, um, we shot half of the film and then I, I cut in a load of um i had the voiceover recorded and i just cut in a load of um, photos of a different house um, but what we realized was it, you had to that wasn't making the most of the conceit of of these property website photos so we actually organized a whole second shoot um to to, to then um get a better production value and we set up a fake property um that was for sale and we kind of put we you know we put props in there yeah. and we got we got actors in so rather than using the existing ones, we, we, got, we got a whole bunch of people. We drove out to the countryside, found this amazing uh, b and um, in the Cotswolds, which is an extremely lovely part of England. And, um, and they were kind enough to let us use it for quite a cheap rate. Stunning garden. And um, so, yeah, we had an entire second shoot to try and like really wring the value out of that central section. And, that, and now that is the bit that works. You know, that, that's what the whole film is, really. So well, that changed, yeah. I mean, I mean, really more so, what changed in you? You know, from mm. the guy who was sitting on the bench, and sees, <laughs> you know, yeah. Jogger, Adonis of a man, <laughs> compare yeah. himself, and then go after and make this film about his life and this culture and the society that he lives in mm. in such a profound way. Now, what changed in you? Um, well, I would like to say um, that I don't compare myself to other people anymore because that's the lesson I should have learned, but I cannot help. I still compare myself to other people all the time. Um, I can't get around that. I mean, yeah, if only, if only that had changed. Um, the uh, other thing, I suppose, in a sense, my attitude towards, towards jogging has, has changed because through, simply through making the film and kind of working out like what what issue I had about it, um, I I know where I stand now. I know I I know where I stand on this issue of, I, I mean, and maybe this is worth contextualizing for people. The, the it's the thing about jogging, it's not that it's exercise. I think exercise is great, but it's the kind of it's the the blind aimlessness of accumulating numbers in jogging that 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 I found really. Um, incomprehensible and somehow as an analog for society this kind of aimless you're running forwards but you don't really go anywhere mm. uh, and you don't really know where you're going and all you're doing is accruing stats for me that was that was the real nub of, of why jogging annoyed me and I have now I think you know it's not like the problem has gone away but at least I know where I stand on it and I have more clarity uh, when I think about you know, 
the, the world we live in. And when I think about, um, when I see joggers in the park, you know, mm. I feel like I, I, don't, I don't resent them as much anymore because I understand it. Well, I would like to offer two things, two ideas. Mm. Um, one is, you know, I jog, and, um, it, you know, when I, we talked the first time, I was like, yeah, I jog, my wife looks at houses. I mean, this is like, uh, I feel, mm. you know, um, absolutely um, <laughs> schooled in a way by this movie. But I'm certainly engaged very much, entrenched in the tension between achievement, success, and, and mm. happiness, and peace, and, mm. and uh, value, and, and reconciling those two. So, um, but here's, you know, one pers uh, uh, perspective on jogging that yeah. might be or interesting for you. Uh, you know, I jog um, three times a week for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. and my whole thing is about the 30 minutes and the cardio. So it's not, you know, it's like I don't, I don't track miles. I don't track, you know, as long as I do my 30 minute boom check. Okay. You know, three times a week. I know that that's the optimum cardio health for mm -hmm. my welfare, and and I also it's a great like if I'm like pissed or whatever, and I'm just wrestling or something. Boom! I'll go just hit the run, and you know I'll get that runner's high, and I'm like, Woo, things are you yeah know, not that bad. I mean, and people tell me that it's good for thinking as well. I like right. as in while you're running, you can really think. You know, yeah. you can think things through. Yeah, the clarity of mind is you know it, it's very helpful. Definitely. Yeah. So that's yeah. another reason. So, um, so you know, if it's not this like kind of you know racking up the numbers things, but it is sort of this cardio and you know inhaling. Like one of the things that I really like kind of happened after I started jogging is I really started liking the cold air mm. and that crisp. You know, oh yeah, and just wow, just felt you know <laughs> really good. So, um, you know, I wanted to just kind of offer that with this kind of other take on achievement and yeah. maybe like just. Maybe that's like, it's not about racking up numbers, but really like creating these experiences. Yeah, you know? it's, and your own well-being is enhanced by it. I'm sure you feel much better and you can think more clearly and you're just healthier. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. And, and similar to that, you know, similar to, you know, kind of bridging that jogging thing to mm -hmm. the guy sitting on the bench and then the guy who like, you know, pulled a marathon a five-year marathon to make this movie. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's heroic accomplishment, mm. dude. That is a yeah. heroic accomplishment, and that is you cre you've created and strung together these experiences mm. that you can not only re reflect upon and, and channel your energies and understand your space and relationship to life and others better, but, you know, help others do the same. Mm. Hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, I think um, that's really kind that you see it as, as a marathon because I mean, yeah, I was I wasn't working on the film full time for five years. I was letting it brew, you know, and it was it, but still a lot, a lot of work, given that it's only a 14 minute film, a lot of thinking went into it. Um, but I suppose the um, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I had no I did. It wasn't really like, you know, I wasn't trying to like get get footage on my reel or anything. It was like something I genuinely wanted to make. Yeah. Um, but um, I suppose, the, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you about how the, the, the benefits of it. And I mean, not to spoil the ending, but the, but the guy does act in the character in the film does end up learning something from the joggers. It's just that he has to jog in his own direction rather than in their direction. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's about knowing where you're going, basically. There you have it, man. There that's the have. big, that's the yeah. new. And that's, and that's the comparison that I'm trying to make, because that guy that, you know, started off making the movie and uh, sitting on the bench yeah. doing so great, you know, is really, to me, ends up being the hero who is, you know, the Adonis who ran by him. Yeah, totally, because you, you're not, because you're no longer in competition with that person anymore. You're running in a different direction. Right, you're doing your own thing. Yeah. That's beautiful, yeah. man. <laughs> well, we, we're going to have to end it there, man. I, I think that's, you can't say anything more than that. Yeah, right? thank you. It's been great. Really nice talk. It's, it's nice to talk about, you know, because we often people don't go that deep into these films. They just yeah. watch them and that's it. So it's really nice to be able to dwell on stuff and, you know, thrash it out. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I think that's Thanks what a lot. we filmmakers do. And David, you're <laughs> on the next project, so please share a little bit about that. 
Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so next weekend we're going into uh, we're going to shoot a teaser for a feature that I'm writing. Um, it's going to be a ten minute scene. Uh, I'm uh, I'm from Somerset in Southwest England, and uh, I've always wanted to make a musical set in the area where I grew up, which is the Mendip Hills. Um, and I've oh. always felt that um, there's something because musicals are kind of about dreaming. I always felt that there was there was a really kind of dreamy kind of atmosphere to the place where I'm from, which is very different to the kind of, you know, and I did enjoy La La Land, that film that we were talking about, and, and that talks about dreamers. But I feel like if you go to the countryside, there's a whole different kind of dreaming that goes on there. It's a much more kind of like, you know, it's not like career dreaming. It's it's dreaming like, I mean, it's kind of like in, in, in the prime location. So I, the kind of freedom to, to let your mind wander so it's it's i'm trying to capture that in a film basically and it, the frame for it is uh, there's a pop star who suffers a career meltdown moves back to her parents house over christmas time it's a christmas movie as well by the way and um so it, it's going to be set in the scene we're filming is set in a pub and uh, she gets incredibly drunk and causes a lot of trouble and then sings about it so that'll be this weekend that sounds great man yeah well, have a great weekend enjoy it thank you have a lot yeah of look forward you know let me know when that is uh, yeah you know some way where we can share with our audience yeah totally that sounds good it should be ready kind of summertime i would say okay cool yeah great canon filmmaker prime location writer director thanks everybody pleasure thank you man till next See you time soon. yeah okay cheers cheers Hey guys, thanks for tuning in this week. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe and leave us a like and or a comment. It makes a big difference. Plate Forward is brought to you by DigiPops, where we're building a community to put film and filmmaker discovery in your hands. Here, filmmakers and fans, the creative class, recognizes each other fairly and transparently through a community-curated film festival each quarter. It's coming soon. Thank you.